Hey guys, I'm Ted here to give you another uh, lecture and for today's lecture we're going to discuss the women's movement. Now, the women's movement, uh, before we begin our, uh, our, uh, our lecture on that, I'd like to do a quick and very simple recap on what we discussed in our last lecture. So in our last lecture, we uh, wrapped up our discussion on African Americans after Reconstruction. Uh, we touched on Jim Crow segregation, how it permeated every aspect of life. Um, it was rooted in uh, very racist perceptions, very racist notions, uh, and particularly in the uh, notion that um, that the uh, redeemers, that the segregationists, wanted to reinforce the community aspect, the uh, the community fears that had been uh, really just rampant, um, the, the, the community control that had been established uh, during the uh, chattel slavery period and then during the, uh, uh, and that had sort of been broken during Reconstruction and they wanted to reestablish that, they wanted to reestablish that dominant control. Uh, we looked at groups such as the Buffalo Soldiers and the Exodusters uh, who were trying to uh, prove uh, prove something to themselves, prove something to their communities, and prove something to the republic at large uh, regarding African American capability. The Exodusers wanted uh, better lives um, in states uh, in state and in Western territory. They went to the Indian Territory, um, where we now know as Oklahoma. Uh, they went to Kansas and Nebraska, of course, particularly in Kansas. A large number of them went to Kansas. Um, and of course, they were led by Pap Singleton. The Buffalo Soldiers fought uh, primarily. They earned their nickname fighting the uh, um, the Native American groups on the plains. They were called Buffalo Soldiers because their woolly hair reminded the natives of the uh, of the buffaloes. Um, the uh, the Buffalo Soldiers themselves uh, sort of had this uh, sort of had to um, deal with the conflicting uh, what, what conflicting emotions so on on one hand being an oppressed group helping uh the oppressor dispossess another group of their ancestral lands um so a lot of complicated feelings there and of course the um the the rival ideologies um of booker t washington and w e b e b uh w e b dubois um, Washington and Dubois uh, both um, wanted to um, help the African American community. They wanted to lead the community. Uh, they they just could not come to terms on uh, on how to do so. They were fundamentally they they have fundamentally flawed uh, views and each other's opinions. Washington, of course, favored uh, accommodations with uh, segregationists. Um, Dubois, of course, opposed it. He uh, was militantly opposed to segregation, and he, of course, uh, was all in favor of educating African Americans. He wanted to educate what he called the talented tenth to to uh, inspire, to sort of lead, to uh, serve as the beacon on the hill to the rest of the republic on the capabilities of African Americans. And Washington, of course, uh, utterly... Um, utterly unprepared, utterly unwilling to have uh, African Americans engage in any political or artistic output. Uh, very much um, wanted African Americans to be completely working men. He wanted them to pursue working men's career and to not uh, consume themselves with poetry or or uh, any other sort of writing or... or uh, or any sort of political career. Washington himself uh, embarked on a uh, on a political career, becoming a uh, a wheeler and dealer, um, handing out political patronage to African American voters and those who sought local elections. Uh, though those who um, weren't in the uh, redeemed states and still held the right to vote, he um, wheeled and dealed with uh, with them, um, becoming a uh, an influence broker. Uh, he also wrote and published his own autobiography, becoming um, an author in the process, something that he uh, had warned others not to do. So um, a lot of uh, a lot of number of uh, interpretations with, uh, with Booker T. Washington's career, but uh, but let's dive right into our, our lecture topic for today, which is the women's movements, and uh, to be certain. <clears throat> 
uh, there had been a number of um, movements, a number of uh, practices, a number of uh, sort of um, a number of uh, avenues for women to uh, express themselves prior to uh, the late 1880s, um, some of which we've already discussed, uh, like the Seneca Falls Convention, in which um, the modern uh, feminist movements can all trace their, their, their descent to. Um, but in the late 19th century, to begin with, let me just say that, within the late 19th century, there was a very strong belief in the differences between men and women. Uh, there was a strong belief that, the, that both sexes had their own sphere, uh, spheres of influence. Uh, men were muscular, rational, and inte uh, intellectual. These attributes led men, it was uh, thought, to build an agricultural, commercial, and industrial society. Women, on the other hand, were seen as delicate, uh, intuitive, and therefore they should stay at home. Uh, women were seen as the beacons of, of uh, love and security. Um, now this theory only applied to upper class women. Um, and this was uh, this was the theory that that kept women out of um, the workforce and, and kept them in the home. Uh, and again, only apply to upper class women, upper class uh, and middle class women. Um, most families were too poor not to have all capable members, uh, not to not to not have all capable members working. Um, those women who had to work, uh, even though they had to work they did aspire to one day not having to work. Uh, the majority of medical professionals in the United States um, were also of the, uh, were also um, had this uh, consensus that uh, higher education led to hysteria in women. Um, they, they also believed that political rights would make women masculine and threaten gender boundaries. Uh, early suffragettes tended to align with this view. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony argued that women would tone down the animosity of politics. And you have to remember that these women were out and about during the, uh, the crisis years, during the years of, um, of, a, of a sectional breakdown during the, uh, the turbulent 1850s that we discovered where um, fire eaters were, were just running rampant in the South and it was uh it, it was sort of their their selling point that if you gave women the right to vote, women would uh sort of um influence the men to scale back their political attacks, and it would allow them to uh the the um the pregnancy of women would allow them to sort of um deescalate tensions. Uh, they they would uh, provide a nurturing atmosphere for politics. Uh, and, and this was what was happening in the cities um, that were going very rapidly and becoming more and more influential. Now, on the farms, on the farms, uh, life continued pretty much as before um, with uh, farm duties, uh, upkeep duties split along gender lines. In the cities, there were... In the cities, there was a, uh, a much stronger separation. Well, excuse me, huh? sorry about that. And in, 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 in the cities, there was a much stronger separation uh, of the jobs between the sexes. Um, and, and this was often dressed up in pseudoscience language. Uh, many prominent medical professionals were interested in solving the gender question. Uh, in the modern era, we have a consensus that women should not be excluded from professions and political rights because of their gender. We emphasize the similarity between men and women in all aspects of life. Back then, uh, the differences were emphasized and the, and the prominent suffragettes or women's rights advocates did the same. Women were regarded as the nurturer, as the moral guardian of children. Uh, raising children was really the center of their of the universe, it was um uh, that was to be a uh, a central theme, and what was then uh, known as the true cult of womanhood. Um, now, literature, literature at the time, 
was created uh, and advised. Uh, there was this large body of literature that was created to uh, advise women on how to behave and how to meet society's expectations. One looks at uh, Sarah Hale's The Women's Record, which was published in 1854, uh, and it is an encyclopedia of acceptable and exemplary mo uh, mothers throughout history, um, or, or uh, through, uh, through the eyes of an American. Um, a citizen of United States because George Washington's mother um, is, is on that list and she's highly praised within that book. Um, Hales argues that the uh, great men of uh, history were only able to achieve their greatness because of the environments their mothers created. Um, Hales, uh, Hales, uh, Hale, uh, she went on to say that mothers are the ones who should be who should be praised in a society, um, and uh, and this was done had a protective measure against marginalizing the role of women. Uh, the role of mothers was um, was uh, was strongly to be emphasized during infancy over the next coming years, uh, and also during the time doctors were forming the idea that. Uh, ideas about wellness for, for women, especially during pregnancy. Now, the idea was that a pregnant woman uh, who became too excitable would become insane, and that because she was insane, she would pass her insanity on to her unborn child, weakening future generations. Now, the medical community looked towards uh, the scene, uh, but then unknown hormonal change pregnant women uh, endured, uh, citing it as strange and troubling. They, um, they, they often pointed to pregnancy cravings as being unnatural and worrisome. Uh, you, you can see that it was a time in which these were people who were interested, uh, who were observant and interested in answers, but really lacking in, in, our, in our clearer understandings of hereditary uh, traits and also in hormonal changes. Um, now, beginning in the 1870s, women in the city were becoming consumers on their own. And, and this was happening for the first time. Uh, the first department stores were being developed in the United States. With the, um, and, and with the department store, uh, what happened for the first time with that shopping um, ceased from being a chore of necessity and became a leisurely activity for uh, for for, for uh, most European Americans um, and uh, and for uh, a number of other Americans. Uh, most people still had to shop uh, uh, out of necessity. Uh, out of necessity, they they didn't have the the right for for leisurely shopping. Um, but most women, most women uh, worked during this period. Uh, and they worked as domestic servants um, and on farms. One of the first things uh, middle-class Americans of this period did was uh, to go out and hire a domestic servant. Uh, working as a domestic servant was laborious. Um, that's because everything had to be done by hand back then. Uh, there were no laundry washers. There were no dishwashers, no uh, vacuum cleaners, um, no electric or gas stoves. And, and in fact, all the stoves uh, were wooden stoves, um, which means that which meant that you had to uh, always have wood on hand for the stoves, and it was uh, it meant that you know cleaning it uh, was a very dirty process, getting all the ashes and the soot out of the stove, constantly monitoring the stove, uh, monitoring your fire, uh, being very economical with your firewood. Uh, very, very difficult um, profession indeed. Now, um, typically, immigrant women, uh, and I mean uh, by immigrant, I mean mainly Irish and German women, served as domestic servants. Um, as the cities grew, women also began to uh, take teaching positions, particularly for primary schools. Uh, women entered into the nursing profession, as health care began to rise, uh, has an industry and uh, immigrant women also began to take a leading role in uh, the clothing industry and the uh, in the textile industry and garment making. Um, garment districts were often uh, dominated by women now and in particular in New York City the Jewish women began to take over 
um, the garment industry um, has, has their uh, preferred uh, job of choice. And with the rise of the department store, um, women also began to take sales positions. With uh, with the and with the rise of monopolistic corporations, secretary positions uh, also became available for women as well. Now, now men, uh, men were viewed as being the more intellectual and tougher um, than than women, but they were widely. Uh, but it was widely accepted that men had to be ruthless in order to survive in the industrial world. Now there was no room, uh, no room, room, uh, room in business for um, squeamishness or impassivity. Um, this was uh, one of the reasons why uh, the ruthlessness of the great monopolists was accepted. Now at the same time, there was a, there was a growing uh, view that Christianity was becoming uh, feminized and that women um, and that were women being the uh, the protectors of moral virtue and uh, and, and morality um, were, were women being the protectors and so forth uh, that that they were slowly eclipsing masculine images in religion so churches in an effort to reinvigorate um, to reinvigorate uh, men and reinvigorate masculinity, uh, particularly Christian masculinity, they, uh, they they embarked on a campaign that that saw Jesus transformed into a tough guy uh, who was out in the sun all day with his harm with his hammer and the carpenter tools, um, and uh, and this eventually led to the uh, founding of the YMCA. Um, the YMCA would find the way back in the uh, 1840s and spread uh, very rapidly in the United States. And this idea was, uh, and the, the idea was to institute Christian athletic programs. And we'll break here. We'll break here on uh, on this discussion, and we'll pick it back up. Um, we'll pick it back up in our in our next lecture. Uh, as always, I am Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment, and let me know what you thought about this lecture. Uh, and I'll see you guys next time.